What is the declension of Hehora? First declension feminine, pure alpha, rho or vowel, hora, horas, hora, horon, hora. Horai, horon, horais, horas, horai. What's the declension of hey phone? First declension feminine, pure eta, phone, phonase, phone, phonane, phone. Phonai, phonon, phonice, phonus, phonai. What's the declension of hey doxa? First declension feminine mixed, doxa, doxes, doxe, doxon, doxa. Doxi, doxone, doxice, doxice, doxi, sorry, doxus. Oh, messed up my keys to put. What's the declension of ha prophetes? First declension masculine, prophetes, prophetu, prophete, prophetane, propheta. Propheti, prophetone. Prophetis, prophetus, propheti. What's the declension? Of halagas. <laughs> Second declension masculine. Lagos, lagu, lago, lagon. Okay. Lagoi, lago, lagois, lagus, lagoi. What's the declension of ta ergon? Second declension neuter. Ergon, ergu, ergo. Ergon, ergon. Erga, ergon, ergois, erga, erga. What's the declension of ha archon, archontas? Third declension, masculine, feminine. Archon, archontas, archonti, archonta, archon. Archontes, archonton, arcusi, archontas, archontes. What's the declension of ta soma, somatas? Third declension neuter, soma, somatas, somati, soma, soma. Somata, somatone, somasi, somata, somata. What's the declension of ha, he, ta? Ha, tu, to, ton, hoi, tone, tois, tus. He, tes, te, tain, hi, tone, tice, tus. Ta to to ta ta tone tois ta. What's the declension of ego su? First and second person pronouns ego, amu, amoy, ame, he mes, he moan, he mean, he mus. Su, su, soy, se, who mes, who moan, who mean, who mus. What are the principal parts of luo? Luo, luso, et lusa, leluca, lelumai, eluthane. What's the conjugation of luo in the present active indicative? Luo, lues, lue, luamen, luete, luusi. Infinitive, luane. What's the conjugation of luo in the present middle passive indicative? Luamai, lue, luetai, luamatha, luestha, luantai. Infinitive, Lewis thy. What's the conjugation of Amy in the present indicative? Amy, A, Esti, Esmen, Este, AC, AC, pardon me, pardon me, AC, there it is. What's the conjugation of Lu in the imperfect active indicative? Eloan, Elois, Eloe, Eluamen, Eluete, Eloan. What's the conjugation of Lu in the imperfect middle passive indicative? Eluamen, Elu, Eluita, Eluamitha, Eluista, Eluanta. What's the conjugation of Amy in the imperfect indicative? Amen, Ace, Ain, Amen, Ata, Asun. What's the conjugation of Lua in the future active indicative? Luso, Luces, Luce, Lusamen, Lusita, Lususi. Infinitive, Lusane. What's the conjugation of Lua in the future middle indicative? Lusamai, Luce, Lusitai. Lusamatha, Lusistha, Lusantai. Infinitive, Lusestai. What's the conjugation of Ami in the future indicative? Esamai, Esse, Estai. Esamatha, Esestha, Esantai. What's the conjugation of Lua in the first aorist active indicative? Elusa, Elusas, Eluse. Elusamen, elusate, elusun. 
Infinitive, lusi. What's the conjugation of lua in the first aorist middle indicative? Elusamein, eluso, elusata, elusamatha, elusastha, elusanta. Infinitive, lusasthai. What's the conjugation of lumbano in the second aorist active indicative? Elabon, elabes, elabe, elabamen, elabete, elabon. Infinitive, labane. What's the conjugation of lumbano in the second aorist, act, uh, pardon me, second aorist middle indicative? Elabamein, elabu, elabata, elabamatha, elabestha, elabanta. Infinitive, labesthai. What's the conjugation of lua in the perfect active indicative? Leluka, lelukas, leluka. Lelukamen, lelukate, lelukasi. Infinitive, lelukenai. Lovely. What's the conjugation of luo in the perfect middle passive indicative? Lelumai, lelusai, lelutai. Lelumitha, lelustha, leluntai. Infinitive, lelustai. What's the conjugation of luo in the pluperfect active indicative? Elelukain, elelukes, eleluke. Elelukemen, elelukete, elelukesan. What's the conjugation of luo in the aorist passive indicative? Eleuthain, eleuthes, eleuthe. Eleuthemen, eleuthete, eleuthesan. Infinitive, luthani. What's the conjugation of luo in the future passive indicative? Luthesamai, luthese, luthesatai. Luthesamatha, luthesasthe, luthesantai. And our prayer. Yesu, huye, David, eleison me, hamartalan. All right. Take a seat. I feel like we could take a whole hour just talking about observation uh, from that recitation. Um, this is just a, a shout out or a, an encouragement on the power of recitation. Um, we were doing the book of Esther, for example, which is a really strange book. I don't know if you've read the book of Esther in a while, but anyway, it's a strange book. There's a lot of, it's a challenging book to read, um, to figure out wh why is it there? Like, why is that book in the Bible? Um, so we were talking about that today, and one of the students said, well, maybe it has something to do with this chunk that you put in our recitation. I was like, oh, maybe? What, what, what's that about? Anyway, so it just became this, like, starting ground for a dialogue, um, the little, you know, couple of, whatever it is, five sentences that they memorize as a part of their history and literature recitation. So anyway, uh, it can be really helpful, especially if you want to give them big building blocks to kind of go from there. So lesson seven, um, questions, comments on the homework? I think I got all the, um, um, all the answer keys out and everything. Anything in particular stand out to you from that lesson on pronouns? Yeah, the, yeah, that, um, yeah, it gets to that like comparative, like good, better, best thing. Yeah, so our adjective here, there's not, um, the form in some languages is different. Here we can actually see it's not. Um, so our big clue here is this dative. Um, this could be called a dative of advantage. It's not actually an indirect object. So let's kind of zoom out for just a second. So um, indirect object, what's an indirect object? Okay, well let's zoom out. What's a subject? Isn't it funny how often it just goes back to like this? <laughs> ah, you keep asking the same questions? Yeah, that's, this is why, by the way, I mean, dead serious. Um, Alicia, what, what like ages are your kids? So my oldest son is in sixth grade. Okay. Okay.
Okay, awesome. By the way, you just made both guys in this room feel great by like you had to actually work to remember your kids' right. ages. You hear me on the phone. Do you like, not know who these kids are? What am I, a Jeopardy? Please hold. <laughs> yeah, right. All right. So the only reason I want to highlight this, and this is true, is Bennett y'all's oldest? Is that right? Yeah. Okay. All right. So. Wait, how old is Bennett? He's six. Yeah. So like, or I knew he was in kindergarten. But anyway. Um, so one of the things I became convinced of very early on in teaching was that we just try to do too much stuff. We just try to do way too much. And again, just <laughs> illustrative of this. You just ultimately, like for example with grammar, you just keep coming back to the eight parts of speech and kind of the peculiarities of each of the eight. You don't you don't need to do all this stuff. Diagramming, a tool, a helpful tool, but it's just a way to illustrate what we're going to illustrate here in a different way. I'm a fan of diagramming. It can be a really helpful tool for some kids to help visualize it. The goal is not diagramming a sentence. The goal is being able to imagine, image in your mind what's going on. Okay? Probably reading too many books, probably just doing too many things. But the question is, this is kind of like the question you were asking me, I think, before Christmas break, right? What are the essential things? What, what is the stuff that matters? Okay? All right. So the stuff that matters when it comes to grammar. Parts of speech and then basic function in a sentence. And then it just gets more complicated from there. Okay? Or it just gets, it just gets uh, more from there. You, know, you might have 38 prepositional phrases, but they're still just prepositional phrases. You might have 12 genitives, but they're still just genitives. Okay. So what's a subject? What's a good like adult level definition of a subject? Okay, and then we could say, and how will I know what the sentence is about? My joke is always like, so, uh, or sometimes people say like the main thing in the sentence. And I was like, well, it's gotta be Jesus then. If Jesus is ever in a sentence, he's the main thing because he's the main thing, right? Isn't that good theology, right? No, uh, okay, so that's not what we mean, right? So we're still kind of thrown back onto yes, this is what the sentence is about. How will I know that, though? Now, ready? Let's just play with Greek for a second. How could I know, for example, um, here in number four, hoi pistoi is the subject. How do I know that's the subject? Excellent. So that's where a case language, for example, here, or again, uh, agathos ago, right? I could say, oh, the subject goes in the nominative case. But notice, we still haven't answered the question of what a subject is. We've just said, well, in case languages, like Greek or Latin or German, the subject will show up in the nominative. But we still haven't asked, or we haven't answered, pardon me. So what is it? Okay. So the subject, we could say, the form of the subject in Greek or in Latin is the nominative. But that doesn't actually answer the question. So let's come at it again. What is a subject? Okay. Good. So we're going to kind of break at this point, and this is totally fine. Our road is going to diverge in the wood, especially since we're adults. Okay? So we can have really simple sentences. For example, something like, Moses saw. And that's kind of what you're talking about, Alicia, right? Moses is the doer, and he does the action of the verb, right? So that is a perfectly fine definition, pardon me, for one kind of sentence pattern. This is an active sentence pattern. The subject is the doer. The subject's the actor. That's all that means. Latin, ago, agare, agi, acta means I do. Okay. But then we have, could have another sentence pattern, which is actually what we've got here. I am better. I am better. And that could be an adjective or it could be a noun, like I am Batman. The greatest and most important sin. I'm just kidding. Okay, so that's different now because now my subject isn't acting, right? So what can we call this? So if here the subject was the actor, it was active, the subject's the active one. What's this? Mm -hmm. 
Ajá. Okay, so okay. So now we're talking about this is a we could call it a linking or a stative verb, meaning like state of being. So now notice the subject isn't acting, the subject is just being the fancy pants word is predicated about. You're just telling me what the subject is without an action, specifically, without an action. I am Yahweh your God. That is a linking verb sentence. And then there's a relative clause that says, who brought you up out of Egypt? Now, who is a subject of an active verb? Who brought? And it takes a direct object, you. But there's one more sentence pattern. The classic, Caesar was stabbed. Caesar was stabbed. What is that? It's passive. Good. That's somewhere in there, right? Yeah, so this is passive. And again, we can kind of think of that word, okay, passive. So, like, are you going to be active or are you just going to sit there and be passive, right? Depending on how you argue and fight and relate to other people, right? Passive. C.S. Lewis, I think I've quoted this maybe before, but he says, you know, the cross is God's declaration that the passive wins out over the active. He's just kind of like joking about grammar teachers saying never use the passive. Anyway, it's a bad C.S. Lewis joke. Okay, so now wait a second. It seemed like we said the subject is the actor, or we could say the subject is the one being acted upon, or the subject is doing nothing whatsoever. Do you see the problem with this definition or lack of definition? So maybe Greek could help us out, or maybe the verb am could help us out. So let's go to Greek here, and then we can play with um, English as well. Kahina ti uk estheis. What's the subject of estheis? How do you know that? Oh, yes. But wait a second. There is no subject anywhere in this clause spelled out explicitly, is there? You said it's hidden right here in estheis. And you're exactly right. So wait a second. The subject doesn't even have to exist at all in the sentence in Greek. Okay. It tells you what? Excellent. Okay. So now we might be able to get at this question. Watch what happens here. We say, I am better. But now let's change our subject. And it, we could make it you. You am better? That's not right. You. Come on, just play along. You are better. But now let's change our subject again. Well, how about she? She is better. And sure enough, we could change it in the plurals as well. We are better. Now, for the rest in English, right, it's just going to be are, right? But this is a huge clue of what a subject is. And this is a huge clue of what a subject is. In every language I know except English, this is the one exception, <laughs> by the way. Otherwise, English only changes its form once, right? For example, I swim, you swim, he swims, we swim, y'all swim, they swim, right? Every other verb in the English language only has two forms in the present tense. It's either that simple form, I eat, he eats, right? And they almost all add S or ES depending on the spelling. Agree? The only exception is this verb right here. Am, are, is, are. And notice that this are is different from this are, if you could apply your Greek eyes to it. Can't, right? 
How is this R different from this R or this R or this R? Good. This is a singular. Now this is second person, and this is second person, but this is actually a second person singular R, and this is a second person plural R. But we would never see that in Latin, would we? We were having this conversation. Oh man, it was a pretty heated conversation the other day. And I used the English word you. The person thought I meant you. I meant you. And they're like, why are you talking to me? I was like, oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, humes, I meant y'all, y'all, wos, y'all. Ustedes, I don't know, you know, it's a real limitation in our language, okay? It just is. It's not good, bad, it's just what it is. Okay, all right, so here's the thing. In Greek, it helps us see what a better definition is of the subject. And here's the definition. The subject is the thing that the verb goes with. The subject is the substantive, if you want to get really fancy, noun, pronoun, or substantive adjective. It's the substantive that the verb goes with. Such that if I changed my verb, for example, or my subject, pardon me, to first person singular to first person plural, I would have to change the verb. But that's not true about anything else in that sense. Watch. In the beginning, God creates. In the beginnings, God creates. No, nope, I can change that prepositional phrase. Watch, in the beginning, God creates heaven. I change it, but I didn't have to change the verb, did I? Because I didn't mess with the subject in number. And so whether we're talking about an active action that the subject is doing, or a passive, the subject is suffering it. Or we're just talking about straightforward predication, what it is the subject. The subject and the verb are the things that are intimate together. That if I change one, so to speak, I must change the other. Does that make sense? Because what we're going to learn in the next chapter is we're going to see, for example, this passive thing come into action. And we've been reciting it already. Luamai, lue, luatai, luamitha, luestha, luantai. That still conjugates based on person in number, but it's just an, uh, going from an active to a passive form. That's just what it is. Okay, So the subject goes with the verb. And if there's one thing we can understand, like when I think about like third grade Latin, for example, what do I want my third graders to know? I want them to know that these two things are B, F, 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 F. They always relate to each other. And that's always a challenge, by the way, when you're teaching younger kids. Just It doesn't matter if it's church catechism or whatever. What's an appropriate definition for a 7-year-old kid, 9-year-old kid, 30-year-old adult, 50-year-old adult? You know what? What is appropriate? So for us, we're going to go with the adult definition. The subject is the thing that agrees with the verb. Does that kind of work? Okay. We're going to get your sentence now. What's a direct object? Excellent. A direct object, we are speaking specifically now about that sentence pattern. Because watch, ready? What's the direct object in a passive sentence? Caesar was stabbed. What's being acted upon? Caesar. And he's the subject, right? So when we say direct object, we're already saying we're talking about an active verb here. We're not talking about a linking or a stative verb because there is no direct object, right? So we know... Now, for example, that this is an active verb and that activeness or the activity is being done or received directly. I think of my old physics teacher, Scroop Doggy Dog. His name was Mr. Scroop. We called him Scroop Doggy Dog. Best teacher I ever had, I think, prior to college. That you watch that whoo, transfer of energy from the subject doing his thing to that direct object. So now let's ask, what's an indirect object? I knocked over or dropped the water bottle. 
I drop water bottle. I throw marker. Did I just act on you? What did I act on? Good. And the direct uh, the, and the marker grammatically is the direct object. The direct object, though. Good. So this is actually what the direct object is. The direct object acts on, or again, if you want to think about it in terms of like a physics, it transfers its energy that it got from the subject to an indirect object. This is like the classic stupid argument of like, guns don't kill people, people kill people. <sighs> Who acted? <laughs> like, <laughs> you'd say like, yeah, right? So this is how it works. Okay, this is how energy transfer works, I think. I'm not a physicist. I think this is how it works. Okay. So, Technically, when we're talking about an indirect object, we're talking about, notice, an active sentence where the subject is doing something, and it's doing something or it's acting upon that direct object. And then that thing moves towards or impacts or whatever it is, an indirect object. I kick the ball to Alicia. I didn't kick Alicia. I kicked the ball to you. But again, if you were thinking about like dominoes, right, that ball would have knocked down the domino. But I didn't directly knock down the dominoes. I kicked the ball to the dominoes or at the dominoes or something like that. Okay. All right. So here, all this to say is, this is one question based on soy right here. This is a data, but it's not an indirect object because we don't have this kind of a setup. Does that make sense? I am better. Literally, am I not good for you, or good to you, this is what's called a dative of reference. I'm not talking about, again, like this indirect objectness. I'm talking about, I'm not talking about, am I, am I good for Jerusalem? Am I good for whatever? <laughs> to be, to, for the priesthood? Am I good? This is, uh, this is uh, Samuel's mom, Hannah. Um, he is talking specifically about his goodness with relationship to her compared with, or contrasted and compared with, huper. Now this is really important, huper. This is our word with your question. This is a dative, could be called a dative of reference, or a dative of, um, well, no, it wouldn't be a true dative of comparison. But anyway, a dative of reference with huper setting up the comparison. Than ten sons. I am greater than ten sons. It would be outside of the question. Am I, or pardon me, I am greater than 10 sons for you. But it's a question. Am I not greater than 10 sons for you? And this sets up, uh, what kind of question is it? Am I not greater than 10 sons for you? He thinks it's rhetorical. Of course, there's some dramatic irony going on, right? He doesn't understand why his wife isn't eating. Come on, I'm, I'm better. <laughs> I'm better than 10 sons, clearly. Not to Hannah, you're not... So, there's, that's kind of a theme in Samuel called First Kingdom in the Septuagint, that the priesthood's out of control. There's a, another pun later where Eli and his sons, uh, Eli, if you remember, the fat of an animal is dedicated to the Lord, and Eli is fat, and there's a kind of a pun like he's been eating the Lord's share and it's not doing good for him. Anyway, there's a the, yeah, subtle, subtle literature, uh, Hebrew literature. But anyway, that's, that's kind of what's going on. So you've got the priesthood, and you've got these men in particular, and this kind of runs throughout the scriptures, is the men who don't get it. Um, and just before this, if you remember the priest, Eli has already approached Hannah and said, are you, what, are you drunk? What's going on here? No, I'm not drunk. I'm mourning. Don't you know, what, you know, don't you know the difference between mourning and drinking? Um, kind of shows up later in Acts, right? These men are drunk. No, these men aren't drunk. It's not even time of the day to be drunk. It's, uh, it's 5 o'clock somewhere, but... No, that's not what's going on. You don't know the Bible talks about it's 5 o'clock somewhere, but it's there. It's there in the text. Okay, so anyway, so that's what's going on. Any other questions? All right, let's get into our new chapter then. All right, our next chapter continues 
talking about, now actually, uh, Croy loves us by not saying what it is. Actually, um, flip to page 40 if you want. Uh, one thing that I love that he does is he just says, forms of the demonstratives. Now, we, what's funny to me is he doesn't say what part of speech those demonstratives are. So let me see, if I, if I asked you, what do you think? The forms of demonstratives, and then notice he says, uh, the demonstrative hutas, this, versus the demonstrative ekanos, that. So if I asked you, what part of speech are hutas, near demonstrative, and ekanos, far demonstrative, what would you say? Okay, how so? Um, because... Good. Don't you see this? <gasps> huh. That's pretty cool that you thought that. This is wrong. Right, or that is wrong. What did you say? The back can also be used differently. Yeah. It's, it's tricky when you jump languages. What do you think? Uh, different part of speech? Are you okay with pronouns? totally fine. <laughs> Alright, how about this? I'll give you another example. That book is lost. What does that sound like? What's that? Which is what part of speech? The man. A man. The women. A woman. We'll think about what's it doing, the man, this book, that book. Good, it's describing a noun, so therefore it would need to be an adjective, okay? Huh. I'll give you one more example. Uh, these uh, uh, ran away. But in the Greek, the these would be masculine. So it'd be almost translated like the men ran away or men ran away. That sure sounds like maybe a noun. So what I want to suggest, we don't have to go any further into the grammar, uh, grammar weeds on this one, but when you think of these demonstratives, and I think the reason he actually doesn't put what part of speech is because at their root, demonstratives are adjectives. They could be substantive adjectives that kind of work like a generic you know, pronoun. Or again, substantive adjectives that work like a noun. For example, um, uh, uh, a canine. Uh, those women, a canine, just drop it into the feminine and then you can supply a generic female you know, feminine noun to go with it. But probably at the root, they're adjectives. And we know that because, as you said actually with the article, when these, no pun intended, when these show up in Greek, they're always going to, with very few exceptions, they're going to go with an article adjective. Ha hutos anthropos. This man. We won't say the this man. Much to the chagrin of some of my more literal students who really can't get rid of, like, but it says the. Why can't we say the this man? And I was like, because you never ever in your life have said the this man. But it says the, and they can't get over the like the word for word. Man, that's, that can be hard. When that's implanted deep in your brain, it can be a hard thing to, to uh, deal with. Okay? All right. So, so that's the big so what as far as what's going to go on in this chapter is we're adding a new adjective, an adjective that oftentimes you'll be able to spot in this attributive setup. Right? That's what we're talking about here. It's giving an additional attribute to a noun, that book versus a substantive adjective functioning or taking the place of a noun. And then we'll usually supply just kind of a generic, just like we saw, hoi pistoi, the faithful one, versus hai pistai, uh, the faithful women. So sometimes, remember, masculine doesn't necessarily um, tell us whether it's like ones, generically, people, versus um, feminine. If it's dropped into the feminine, you know it's feminine, right? It's got to be all 
ladies, if that's going to happen. OK, so let's look at our vocab briefly. Um, because I didn't put these, just like with the third person pronouns, if you, if you recall. I, don't, I didn't put those on the recitation because they look almost completely normal, with just like one little exception. Okay, so first, alas, alas, ale, ala. Um, they gave you as a derivative alamorph. Um, you could also think of the word alien. Alien technically comes from the Latin alias, which looks just like this. But anyway, so if that's helpful for like etymology, uh, you can do that as well. The other alien, um, apostello. Ooh. Apostello. Where have you seen this word? Or a derivative of this word? Oh, that gummit. I always forget they give you derivatives in this book. You've seen the word apostle. Good. Okay. All right. Uh, I kind of like when you have to like think of it yourself. I, I appreciate what he's tried to do here for seminary students. But anyway. All right. So we've got apostles. Um, do you know the other common word that we use? Or what's the other common word we use for like Jesus' people? The people who went around with Jesus. Disciples. Okay, cool. All right. So we've got apostle and we've got disciple. Do you know what's, what's the difference between an apostle and a disciple? I've always been told it was generally like you had 12 and I think Paul was considered an apostle. It's kind of like set apart from the disciples. Okay, okay. Okay. Alicia? Um, I have set. It seems. Okay. Whatever, it was Ooh. It's the difference, like, one or like followers, right? That's exactly right. That's exactly right. That's exactly it. But that would be bigger than the that's ex that's exactly right. Yeah. That's exactly right. So so it's really kind of a bigger difference of kind. So a disciple, um, you can of course see a word like discipline, right? Uh, I think <laughs> we are looking at this summer camp. Um, my wife and I worked at summer camps growing up, so this is not an anti-summer camp thing. But we we were looking at this camp, and they have an eight-week summer camp session for the kids. Like, you send them to camp for eight weeks. Oh, again, it's totally up to you. But I was looking at that, I was like, oh my word, can you imagine like, just say goodbye to our 10-year-old? And it's for seven-year-olds and up. Like, it's seven years old, you send them away for two months. Anyway, my wife and I were not exactly on board with that. No judgment, no condemnation. Um, but we were just chuckling because my older brother, who's a Marine, their basic training is 12 weeks. I was like, in eight weeks, that's <laughs> two-thirds of Marine Corps basic training. Like, Holy moly, they could come back very different people. But anyway, at the core of that, again, that military discipline, and this is actually a Latin word, disciplina. It is one who is in training. A student's actually kind of a funny word. Student comes from a Latin word to mean passionate. And of course, as a teacher, I can tell you that most students aren't students, which is why the, the English traditional word was pupil. They are eyes on the board. They're not necessarily souls on fire. I mean, in my classes, they always are. But I'm just saying hypothetically for other teachers, they don't really care about it so much. Okay, so this is someone in training. We call them a trainee, or if you'd like, um, I really like the idea of, um, what's the, what, if you're learning the physical arts, the utilitarian arts, what do we call these? Your apprentice. There we go. Okay. Uh, coming from apprendo, meaning to grasp a hold of. Okay, so anyway. So they're disciples when they're in training. When they are fully trained, now it's time to get sent out. So they become the sent ones. And that is a participle. It's a substantive participle, an apostolos, which is actually what Paul claims to be. Actually, one interesting thing about Paul, and he fights, apparently, there's a fight in the early church about this, Paul claims to be a disciple. Paul's unique place in church history is he is a disciple. He is discipled by the risen Jesus. If you remember, when he comes to faith, he goes away for 13 years before he becomes an apostle to the Gentiles. Kind of wild when you think a fully trained nomikos 
uh, law-taught one. He's fully trained by the Rabbi Gamaliel, but he meets his new rabbi, and he has to start all the way back at kindergarten for 13 more years of radical training. And only then is he ready to be the apostle that we think of him as. Anyway, training takes time. So, that's your apostolic. All right, auta, saute, auta. Now notice, uh, this again could be, this is going to be the tricky, I would say probably the trickiest part in the whole chapter. Autas, aute, auta looks a lot like, as a matter of fact, identical to something you saw already. Check out the previous chapter. See it? It's the same forms as your third person pronoun. Okay? The same form, which just means it looks the same. So that's going to be a question that we're going to have to ask ourselves a lot on these translations. Are, do we have what's called an identical use? Or sometimes you'll see it as an intensifying use. For example, we ourselves knew this. It's a strong way to emphasize we knew. Hey, Mace, our toy. We ourselves. Versus just our toy. They, right, as the third person. So we're going to have to look at some big context things, which we'll see. Okay? Baptizo, uh, sorry, uh, obligatory uh, anger moment. You're not allowed to translate baptizo as I baptize. That's not a translation. Go for it. What is baptism? Simply. I'm not trying to get into a huge argument right now. But what is baptism? It involves hint. It involves water. I'm not even trying to go there. It's washing. Okay, that's all it means. So like if you go to like Jewish writings of the time, John is not doing something different. Like, it would be fair to actually translate his name John the Washer. Okay? He's out there washing. And of course, he's not washing your linen or washing the dirt off of you, right? He's washing the sin off of you. Right? It's a baptism of penance for the forgiveness of sin. That's what the gospel says. All right. Anyway, just my obligatory. Don't transliterate. Help people. Help people. Okay. Aguero. Uh, Irene, ooh, Irene, if you know, what was I reading? I was reading something the other day, and the character named Irene showed up. Uh, she was ironically quite, um, peace, or pardon me, quite uh, rage monster, which the author, I'm sure, knew, and he called her Irene. <laughs> All right, and then you got Akenos, a uh, exousia, uh, authority. I want to talk about authority a little bit. What, what is authority? What does that mean? In 2021, authority is kind of a dirty word. Right? I think of the song by You Might Be Giants, You're Not the Boss of Me Now. You're Not the Boss of Me Now. You're Not the Boss of Me Now. And I can't remember what they say after that. No. Yeah. Oh, man. Come. I thought you'd be a They Might Be Giants guy. No, all right. all right. You didn't listen to enough punk music? That's okay. All right. That's fine. Again, punk music is the essence of it is You're Not the Boss of Me Now. Okay. So, what is authority? Well, do you see any other words in, in English that might be related to authority? Author. Author is related to authority. So how is an author an authority? Or I should say, hopefully, how is an author an authority? Good. We might, we might say it this way. They, they're qualified to talk about what they're talking about. Do they know everything? No, I'm not saying that. But they know what they're talking about. Right? Unlike me with physics. Good night. Okay, I don't know what I'm talking about. I, this is the most basic, like, you know, 101 kind of scenario I've got going on up here. Okay? So in authority, there's a, we could say there's a, there's a, a, a legitimacy that comes through who you are, maybe. For example, a king has a, has a born authority. 
not as Americans, I know. But anyway, hypothetically, just imagine there's such a thing as hereditary right or authority or something like that. Um, but again, it could come through your knowledge or it could come through your character. Paul seems to often use his life context and what he's done as a backdrop for why he has authority to command the churches. Um, I think of my dad, he went um, in the 90s, right as uh, the Cold War was coming to an end, he went to train up pastors in the Ukraine. And almost all of the men who came to these like pastor training seminars, he would like do one in a village, hop on a train and go to another village, and all the pastors from around would come. I just remember him crying, telling us when he came back to the United States. And I, I, as a boy, I didn't know what the Cold War was. I didn't know. But what I remember is him saying that every man who was in that room learning from him had been in prison. The communist regime, that man had been in prison. And so when they got up to preach or to speak, their authority was in the scars on their body. You're going to renounce Christ? No? Well, then you're going to pay for that. And that gives you a kind of authority that no PhD does. No PhD does. Okay. Um, so it's a legitimate claim um, to the right to somebody else to sit underneath you. To submit would be the Latin, or to understand. Stand under. Uh, Jerisco, oh, come on, famous science story, most famous science story ever, the only Greek you ever knew, Archimedes in his bathtub. What does he say? Eureka, Eureka there it is! This is a per well, Eureka is the perfect, remember, le Leluca, 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 okay, that's it, it comes from Jurisco. I have found it, or it has been found. Jurisco just had to displace all that water from his bathtub to realize that gold and other metals displace uh, uh, different amounts of water? I don't know how that works. Again, just another illustration. I'm not a physicist. All right, Crino. Uh, I judge. Nothing super fun there. Uh, let's see. Anything else? Oh, okay, last but not least that I want to um, highlight is Hutas Haute Tutop. Okay, notice here with... Autos, which we already had. Uh, we actually said autos. Now notice we have hutos. Rough breather. And omicron now in the masculine. Rather than the autos, aute, auta. Or here as we have it with the emphatic or identical whew, autos. This is your pronoun. <laughs> This is your emphatic adjective. This is your, your near demonstrative. This is the first real place where your um, accent matters. Okay? First real instance where it's like, oh, okay, that's a different word. Excellent question. Okay, so... Um, would you do me a favor? Would you talk about that chair over there versus uh, this chair over here? Ah, would you say it's far from you or is it near from you? And do you know what demonstrative means? It's really, it comes from, we get the word demonstrate, it actually means to show. So point at it again. So that's near to you because you pointed at, right? you showed the near thing. Versus point at the other chair I was talking about. Good, now it's far from you. So that's all that means. Is, and usually, again, if you could think of it like as a, as a rhetorician or speaker, near, here it is, I'm showing you the thing that's here, like this thing right here. Right, this man. This is the man. Behold the man. Versus that over there. So far means probably spatially far away. Although, you will see it almost used like the former and the latter where the, the, the latter, again, this is going to kind of be tricky. <laughs> okay. I don't know about y'all, but it all, I always have to think slowly and carefully when people use the former and the latter. Is that, is that just me? Or is it, okay. All right. So, stupid, silly example. Okay. Is she your, this comes from Genesis, my Genesis reading this morning. Is she your sister or wife? This isn't like verbatim, but it worked. When 
uh, Jacob, Jacob or Isaac? I'm trying to think who it is in Genesis 25. But anyway, try to pass off that his wife, Rebecca, Isaac, Isaac and Rebecca, Isaac, that's who it was. Anyway, is she your sister or wife? And let's just pretend that Isaac said the latter. Now, just the English. Which one is the latter? It's the later one, right. Now this is where it's really tricky because the later one is also the closer one. Does that make sense? Just a little bit. Like, so like, like in the sentence, the word that was spoken most closely, most nearly, is actually this one. Even though when we describe it, we say the former or the latter. Which at least in my brain is like, well, shouldn't it be like the former is near and the latter is far away? Not so. Okay. All this to illustrate. The latter would be this one. But if they did it, and I don't think they're going to give you any sentences like this to start, this would actually be near. This would actually be far. And you could think of it as like, oh, it's actually like further away grammatically from that pronoun which would be the near pronoun. Why do we call it that? Not the like, no, I think it's really just because like that's the one I most recently just said. That word is nearer than, or, <laughs> this word is nearer than that word. Again, doesn't come up a ton, but that would be one uh, example of where it could come up. It does come up. Hutos? Yes. Who, yeah, no problem. Yeah, exactly. Good. So, Hutos, yes, will always be a near demonstrative. And for us, again, 99% of the time, it is very, very clear that this is being used um, either A, to emphasize or again, just to draw attention. For example, which man do you think went home justified? This one or that one? That, again, that, <laughs> there it is again, that kind of a thing. So it's very clear. And again, the examples we'll, we'll have here are not anything near, near as um, refined. Okay? All right. Or tricky. We get that. All right. So I want to go to the summary, and then um, we're actually going to look at some sentences. All right. So going back to our adjectives. Adjectives, adjectives, adjectives. Because like, like I've suggested, um, these demonstratives, these intensives, they really are at their very core adjectives. They're going to match nouns, pardon me, that they modify in gender, case, and number, right? Because that's how adjectives work. But then they can function a couple of different ways. So first, let's just talk about, let's see if we remember, what are the ways in which an adjective could function? It could be a blank adjective, a blank adjective, or a blank adjective. Predicate. Ooh. What is a predicate adjective? Oh, you give an example. Sure. Ah, that's actually not a predicate because it's not in the predicate necessarily. For example, the evil one will flee. Do you know what was that example he just gave? Yes, good. That was a substantive. Awesome. Good. <laughs> hey, why the wise people learn from their mistakes? Wise people learn from their mistakes. Okay. So a substantive adjective, yeah, would be this the evil uh, you know, one. Okay. And, and and now we could even define it. So yeah, absolutely. Example's a great way to define it. Um, can we give it put a definition to it? And by the way, I'm the kind of guy who, if I'm, when I'm, you know, when I'm teaching, I almost feel like it's always better if you can give me an example or spot it than, like, give me a wordy definition that you can't make sense of. You know, like, if I said, you know, okay, what's the subject? Oh, well, it's the thing that's intimate with the verb. Okay, what does that mean? Right, and it's like, okay, you, you, you memorize the definition, but can you actually tell me what that means? Um, so anyway, so what is a substantive then? Oh. Good. Uh-uh. Oh, 
okay, so it's, um, this is, uh, well, I have a silly way. Do you want to take a run at it? Oh, okay, you like that? All right. This is the silly way I teach it. So it's, it's around fifth grade that, the, that our kids start seeing these things, and they start throwing them in just like that, like the just man or whatever. And so I always joke that it's an adjective putting on its noun pants. So that's my like, joke. I'll like, hike up my pants. Like if you ever watch old Chris Farley skits where he's like, stand a van down by the river. You know, anyway. So that's my joke is like, and I'll give him like the, and like, oh, it's his noun pants. Uh, substantive. Anyway, so it's just stupid stuff. The more stupid stuff you can do, the better. Okay. So anyway, that's what we can say. We can say it's an adjective uh, that acts like a or and, pardon me, adjective and noun, right? And again, the evil one, the good men, the kind woman, whatever. It's like both. You kind of stick it right on there. That's great. Okay, predicate or the third category. It's funny, you left off the one that you, most people oops, think about when if you say kind of, what's an adjective? Yeah, so they actually call it an attributive adjective. But that's totally fine. Attributive. So since we're doing it as an example, what would be our example of an attributive adjective? Brown dog. <laughs> That'll work. <laughs> Brown dog. Excellent. I'm going to change up the way I formatted that. I have some persnickety ninth grade girls this year. Who like if I ever format things in different ways, they like get all they get all huffy. So there's my substantive. There's my attributive. How would we define that? Good. Just describes a noun. Or we could even just say we're going to need this. We're, I'm going to add the adverb directly describes a noun. Hint. 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 Directly describes it now. Versus predicate. <laughs> Good, excellent. And how is it indirect? And actually, this was our example from First uh, Samuel here. I am better. Who's better? What's better? Who's better? The subject, I. But it doesn't directly modify, does it? How does it modify it? Or how does it describe it? How, with what? <laughs> okay. <laughs> it uses a descriptor to describe <laughs> all right here's the all right two ways i'll give it to you one is it's in the predicate notice which means it's with a verb so here's the big difference you've got one of those linking or stative kinds of verbs i am better okay so when we say it's a predicate we mean it describes a noun or a pronoun because now we could have that pronoun, I, notice. But we wouldn't have like brown eye or better eye or something like that, right? Good eye. But rather it describes a noun or a pronoun, by the way, or a substantive adjective. But we don't need to do that today, right now. Uh, through, or we, you know, like in the predicate of a linking verb. So we're not directly like sitting next to it, so to speak. We're not directly doing it, but rather we're doing it on the other half, in the predicate of a linking verb. Okay? Woo! Okay. So those are the three kinds of adjectives that exist. And sure enough, these new demonstrative adjectives could work the same way. Uh, he is this, or this is he. There you go. This is he. Um, here's another one. This man is guilty. Substantive. Uh, who toss? Who toss? Or again, attributive. This man. Ha, anthropos, who toss? 
But what's one thing, or pardon me, one thing that's really tricky that uh, if you flip to page 44, you can see this kind of laid out. I think the trickiest thing for us about this is not only learning the categories, which is, which is tricky, which is really tricky, um, but is also learning the, the way, pardon me, the syntax works. Syntax, just a fancy pants Greek word that means word order. It, oh, it is. Uh, sun means with. Tache. This is like where you get the word like taxonomy or something like that. Um, it just means like with rank or something. It's one of these funny. There, there's some like words where you're kind of like being able to break it down in the Greek is actually not helpful. I, ironically, one of those is the word etymology. Etym etymos means true and logos means like word. So like the true word. Anyway, so ironically, the etymology of etymology is not helpful for deciding what an etymology is. The etymology of syntax is also not helpful, it turns out. <laughs> I don't think. It's not helpful for me, at the very least. All right, so we've got basic word order of Greek. Uh, it could go four different ways. Uh, I'm just going to go back to the beginning. Ha, kalas, uh, anthropos. can't remember what they use on there. Um, ha, anthropos. Uh, ha, kalos, ha, anthropos, kalos, and uh, kalos, ha, anthropos. All right. So <clears throat> I want to just look at the different arrangement here and just kind of just kind of label it. Just kind of describe it. So so for example, I'll take the first one. So in this first one, it goes like this. It goes article, or you can call it article adjective if you'd like. Adjective noun. Does that make sense? Article adjective, ha. Huh? Adjective, colos, noun. Anthropos. Lucas, you want to take the second one? Article. Noun. Article. Excellent. Alicia, you want to take the third one? Excellent. I'll bring us home. Adjective. Article, adjective. Now. Four different arrangements, right? Agree? Now, one quick comment. This would actually be the same, um, for some of them anyway, for example, ha anthropos, ha kalos, this would actually be the same with or without that article. Uh, anthropos kalos uh, uh, needs the article. Uh, kalos anthropos would be the same without the article. So anyway, they might mix those up sometimes on you, but if you learn them with the article, you'll always be, you'll always be good. So one of the things that Greek can do is it can express, if you remember, attributive adjectiveness through the syntax. It's called attributive position. And it can express predicate adjective function through syntax, called predicate position. So you could, we could have a linking verb. The man is good. The man is Whatever, lovely. But you don't need it in Greek. You can just use the syntax, the order of the words, to communicate uh, attributiveness, attributive position, or predicateness, predicate position. Okay? All right. So let's look at that chart and let's see if we can discern. So which of these are which position? And let's put in, put a, I'm going to put a label on it. Okay, good. So they give you the example, ha hagias artas. Article adjective, hagias. So this top one, 
and you use a different color, is attributive position, which just means what again? Good, it's just directly described, so we just translate it, the good man. Again, the beautiful man. That's fine. All right, let me take another one of them. It is also attributive. That's right. The man, the good one. And again, that, that maybe sounds a little more Yoda-y. If you, if you, the man, the good one. Uh, anyway, so yes, also still attributive. But I feel like what I, what I remember when I was first learning this is I really like some of them. For example, I really like this version of attributive position. The good man. I really like that one. It's just like it is in English. Boom, boom, boom. The good man. This one was harder for me. The man, the good one. Notice we would still translate it to good man. So, but that was harder for me. That's exactly right. Here we're probably slightly emphasizing the noun. Here we're probably slightly emphasizing the adjective. Probably not even worth mentioning in a, in, mentioning in a sermon unless you really see like a big contrast. Like in, say you're reading John, and all of a sudden John shifts from his typical attributive position to this attributive position. And then you might be able to say, now, John's done something actually really interesting here to highlight his noun, or, or vice versa. But again, you, you have to have a lot of evidence, body of evidence, to, to be able to make that kind of stylistic argument. Which is why Greek teachers are always like, it could indicate emphasis, but the big thing is just learning for now that it's that. Okay? So that, by, by a, a, a reasonable inference, uh, we've now got these two, our predicate. Now, this one, again, I, I, I feel like I remember liking this one more. The man, good. And I felt like in my mind I could always kind of go like, oh, that's like it says right here, like the man is good. Huh, see, I just supply the linking verb and I feel okay about that. That doesn't make me feel bad at all. And then we have one more Yoda, Yoda-ism here at the very bottom. Good is the man. Okay, and that kind of, all right, I felt good. I could, I could be Yoda one more time here. So we had kind of Yodaness and non yodaness But all I had to say is these are kind of set syntactical construction. That's the big thing we want to take away. This is just set because now as we look at these intensive and uh, demonstrative pronouns now, or adjectives now, we're going to see, oh, some of them use certain positions and not others. Okay? So let's, to wrap up our time here, uh, before we'll do a couple of examples, pardon me. Let's look at, and we'll just go through the list. So you first have, right, attributive adjective. Of course, attributive adjectives use what position? Attributive or predicate? Do, they, do attributive adjectives use attributive position? Like, do they go into attributive position, or do attributive adjectives go into predicate position? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it is. It's Excellent, good, yeah, this is good, all right, okay, we're awake, okay. All right, predicate adjectives go into attributive or predicate position? Okay, all right, now it's gonna get real. Okay, do mere demonstratives go into attributive position, or do they go into predicate position? It is predicate position. So notice, you've got the, <coughs> pardon me, you've got the demonstrative adjective, article adjective, noun or article adjective, now demonstrative, right? And that seems to be true for both the near and the far demonstrative, right? They look like they kind of do the same word order, that, the same syntax. How about the intensive autos? This man himself, I mean, Paul uses this in Romans 8, the spirit himself intercedes. Would he need to put himself or itself, depending on how I want to translate that, uh, it should be a him, but things get interesting sometimes. Okay, so intensive autos, is that in attributive position or predicate position? It is also in predicate position. So I encourage you, 
depending on if you're going to want to pass this book on to somebody, I'll just tell you in my teacher's copy, I mean, I don't have a teacher. My teacher's copy is like my notes. <laughs> anyway, I highlight those and I wrote predicate position out in the margin next to them. So I encourage you, again, if you're a notes person or if you're a book review person, I'm usually a book review person. So I take, I make little margin notes, usually like in purple, that can kind of draw my eye. Okay? So those near, far demonstrative, as well as the intensive, she herself, all take predicate position. Okay, how about identical autos, this same person, this exact lady. That is, that is an attributive position, good. Good, good, good. And then last but not least, the possessive pronoun. Now, before you get nervous about the possessive pronoun, I wanna think for just a second, we haven't talked about the possessive pronoun. How is the possessive pronoun different from all these different adjectives? Demonstrative adjective, or just a kind of simple um, um, standard adjective. I don't, I don't even know what you call it. <laughs> oh, simple adjective, there you go. Versus like a comparative or a superlative, there you go. So a simple adjective, or a demonstrative adjective, or a uh, uh, far, uh, or, or sorry, we already said demonstrative, or an intensive adjective, or an identical adjective. How's a pronoun different from that? How's a possessive pronoun different from that? What do you mean? Okay, so there's just like another thing in the sentence rather than like we're talking about this, you know, this man. You haven't introduced two things. Oh, that's interesting. So why, why is there another thing when it comes to a possessive pronoun versus, say, like an attributive adjective? Okay, well, watch. Ready? It's a possessive pronoun. What's a pronoun? Okay. Whereas, what have we been talking about this whole time over here? Adjectives. So when we're talking about a possessive pronoun, we're talking about, we should note, a completely different part of speech. A completely different part of speech. All of these demonstratives and identicals and intensives, emphatics, they're all just adjectives. But now when we're talking about a pronoun, for example, the bread, and I'm going to translate it in an ugly way, of him. To your point, Lucas, we now have two substantive things. We have bread and this guy. This is not an attribute. Uh, attribute? There we go. This is not an attribute of the bread. This is a separate guy altogether. We're not talking about the bread. We are now saying, well, tell me more about that bread. Oh, it's got this relationship to this guy. It's his bread. And in Greek, of him or his will always be in what case? Genitive. Because wait, wait, how? I thought we said this has to always match the noun. Doesn't this have to match the noun? How can this always be in the genitive? Because it's a pronoun. Because how do pronouns work? No, they are not like chameleons. Adjectives are like chameleons. Adjectives match the noun. They modify in gender, case, and number. How do pronouns work? Okay, let's think about that. What does that mean? And let's, let's use a simple sentence, for example. Um, Moses was wandering in the desert of Midian. His father-in-law told him to bring the sheep. Beautiful, excellent. But we do have a pronoun. That's all we needed. Uh, what was our pronoun? His. Well, why did I say his? For example, if I said Moses was wandering in the desert of Midian, her father-in-law told her to bring the sheep. You wouldn't like that. 
Or if I did it this way. Moses was wandering in the desert of Midian. Their father-in-law told them to bring the sheep. You wouldn't like that either. Because how do pronouns work? Okay. Uh, his versus their. Me versus uh, us. Okay, so we have these three categories. We have case. Yeah, gender. Oh, sorry, I'll do gender first. Gender and number. Okay, so let's think about this for a second. First, let's just start with adjectives. What do adjectives have to match the noun they modify in? Kalos, kalos, pardon me, anthropos. What do they match in? Do they match in gender? They do. Do they match in case? Mm -hmm. Do they match in number? Yeah, those are all nominative, mas or sorry, <laughs> masculine, nominative, and singular. And if I changed that noun, I made it anthropoi, now this adjective would have to become hoi, and this adjective would have to become koloi, right? Because adjectives always match the noun they modify in gender, case, and number, right? Pronouns. Mr. McCord was teaching class. Her lessons were way off. Mr. Roy was teaching class. Their lessons were way off. Okay, we just illustrated two ways to break it. Good. Must match in gender. I just know what I'm talking about. And must match in number. What about case? Watch right. Mr. McCord was teaching class. I don't like him. Whenever I think about it, I always think about putting the noun where the right, 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 right. I know, I know, I realize what you do. So, so this is this is helpful. So, um, the case we'll put it this way depends. Okay. So, pronoun it's standing in place of a noun, right? So again, in English, that would have been I don't like Mr. McCord. Mr. McCord's teaching. I don't like Mr. McCord. So I know what you're saying is like, okay, so it would take the same case a noun in that situation would take, right? Okay. But that's not technically what we talk about with a pronoun. Pronouns have to, they take the place of a noun. And do you remember what we call that noun it takes the place of? The Latin is it falls before, the antecedent. Okay. So again, if it was Moses, it would be a he or a his or a him. If it's me, he, his, or him. If it's Alicia, she, or her, or her, right? If it's plural, uh, they, they, or them, etc., right? So the gender and number will always be set, it will always take, it will always follow the gender and number of the antecedent, period. The case, though, will always be determined just like a noun in that same situation would be. Thank you. I know, isn't it? Man, language, language. There are only eight parts of speech. Isn't that crazy? But just knowing what you're talking about, it's so hard. Oh, it's so hard. Oh, I love that. Yeah, you know what's funny is, I mean, I've taught hundreds of students, and I've never had a student say, oh, but I really think about it as like the now, you know, I've never had somebody say it that way. And, but you're not wrong, you know what I mean? Gosh, so fun. So fun. Okay, so all I want to highlight is, and as you look at this, just, just notice that those possessive pronouns will always be in the genitive. But what I want to highlight is, and, and I would even write it in, that is a possessive pronoun. And a possessive pronoun will always be in the genitive. Because that's the job it's doing. Now, where it's tricky, where it's tricky is, well, hey, wait a second. What if I've got that intensive autos, and that intensive autos is, mo is modifying a noun in the genitive? Of the very bread. 
Now I have a, a problem. Is that an intensive autos or is it a possessive pronoun? The, uh, of the bread of him. Does that make sense? Because I could have an adjective matching a noun in the genitive or, because the form's the same now, I could have a pronoun in the genitive. Good news, very few of those. I mean, relatively speaking, in the grand scheme of things, there are very few of those. But, like all things, you have to know that, hey, that could be an option. But usually it won't be. Usually it won't be. Usually these, um, again, nouns and their adjective buddies, adjective chameleon buddies, they're going to be in some other case. Or again, they'll be plural or singular when the pronoun, the only pronoun option maybe is plural instead of singular or whatever it is. Okay? So, 99, uh, it's not 99, but anyway. You see an outone, it's a possessive genitive. It's a possessive pronoun. Their house. Uh, you see an a outes, that's a feminine possessive pronoun. Her daughter. There are exceptions though, but they're pretty rare. They're pretty rare. Okay? Logic, thinking. All right, let's look at number one, just for the sake of looking at uh, any, oh, I was going to say any, okay, we do. <laughs> I was going to say hello. I thought, surely they gave us some kind of an adjective in either attributive or predicate position. Okay, and they did. All right, hatheos apostele tutan tan profete eis tan laon. And I want to ask, um, normally we wouldn't tackle this sentence this way, but I want to just draw this out, since this is kind of the, the, the exact lesson of this chapter. Do we have an adjective, or adjectives, do we have any adjectives in that sentence? Besides articles, for example, we'd have ha, theos, and tan, profete, and tan, laon. Any other adjectives? It, it is. So highlight this spelling change in your mind. So it can be kind of tricky. Um, and you'll see it uh, if you go back to. That rough breather, that hutas, haute, tuta, you can see it in the neuter already. But that hutas or hauta, uh, haute, pardon me, in the feminine, becomes tutu everywhere else, or tutu, tuto, etc. Okay? So be aware of that. Only in the nominatives, in the masculine and feminine, do that, do that funky little who or how thing. Okay? So that is a demonstrative adjective. Let me write that specifically. Because now we're going to ask. Ah. Ah. <laughs> Ow. There we go. Okay. All right. Tutan ton profete. Um, well, first, these don't look like they match at all. That's the, I mean, one thing my eyes kind of notice. Tutan ton profete. How can that be? Yes, ma'am! Good! So even though it looks feminine with that ain ending, that's one of those rare first declension masculines. Awesome. So this is a great distinction in our minds. We don't say the adjective always looks like, right? Or the endings always look the same. What we say is they must always match in gender, case, and number, and you're exactly right. This is a masculine noun of the first declension, and we can see it's accusative singular. So it is a masculine, accusative, singular. Okay, so now we've got our adjective, tuton. And I just want to ask, what position is that in? Is it in an attributive position? Tuton, ton profete. Or is it in a predicate position? And again, here those are. Good, and which, which of these is it? Is it option one, two, three, four? Good, that's it right there. Adjective, article, noun. That's what we've got there. Okay. So, sure enough, it is in predicate position, but this is where, again, this could be tricky. 
Because what kind of adjective is tuton? It's a demonstrative adjective. And so we have to kind of check, and it, thankfully in this case, but demonstrative, pardon me. Um, it's right up above us on that page. And if you wrote in your book, you didn't have to, but if you wrote in your book, you might notice what do demonstratives do? What position do demonstratives take? They do. So notice we're going to translate it like it's an attributive adjective, right? We're not going to say, for example, this is the prophet. We're going to just say, this prophet. Okay? Even though it's in predicate position, but that's what demonstratives like. They like to be in predicate position. Okay. All right. What's our subject in the nominative? Good. What's Hatheos doing? What's our verb? Good, apostele. So God sends, there's that verb uh, where we get apostle. What does God send? Excellent, there's our accusative direct object. And, but then we have another accusative, tan la'an. Why is that in the accusative? Yes, good job. So that, here we've got one accusative direct object. We have a second accusative object of the preposition ace, which takes its object in the accusative. Awesome. So we can put the whole sentence together. Perfect. Very well done. Very well done. And that's it, folks. It's exactly what it sounds like. So I would recommend, um, as you kind of go through it, um, Again, our purpose, keep our eyes on our purpose. Um, for, for me, my purpose is not that you would become great Greek writers. It's not my goal. My goal is that, honestly, like you could bring a church, or you could bring a Bible, you could bring a church. You could bring a Bible with you to church, and you can follow it along, and you can pick out certain words, and you can kind of see what's going on. And um, the, each week, week by week, you're getting closer. And this whole book, believe it or not, there are only 32 lessons. This is number eight. Now, I'm not a math scholar, but that means you're 25% of the way through, again, a very high level of grammar, at least to where, again, you'd be able to pick up the New Testament, and besides a couple of words, um, again, just vocab, you'd be able to read it pretty well. So you're at that point where, again, you could pick it up, and, and if you had you know, a Greek New Testament, or there are apps and different things you can get for free, or you know, whatever. I try not to have a phone out in church, because... Most people don't believe you're looking at the Greek. So anyway, Greek Bible, worth the investment, I would say. But you can start to look at these things. All I have to say is while you're doing these exercises, I would encourage you to kind of practice this question. Not because it comes up a ton for these uh, demonstratives, for example. But just so you're, again, getting used to drilling in like, okay, what's the adjective? What position is it in? And then how is it functioning? So how, how should I translate it? Right? If it's a a normal, kind of simple adjective. An attributive adjective is going to be translated, you know, the brown dog, right? A predicate adjective is going to be translated, the dog is brown. But with some of these, I'm going to have to get my eyes used to, it's in predicate position, but this actually likes to be in predicate position. That, that's this, this, you know, order it wants to be in. Okay? That's it. And if you have questions, you can ask them, but otherwise. I do. So, so I'll just I'll add one. Yeah, I'll add one thing. I would say, getting into the habit of looking at the whole sentence. I actually think it's a really important habit. Just I think you'll find over time, like you start to just feel the sentence a little better, and then you can always go back and kind of go like, okay, yes, where's my verb? You know, hemes ekamen exousian baptizain, humes de ukakete exousian krinein hemas. So just in reading that, you're could you kind of feel like, like I, I always think of my mind as kind of like a vacuum cleaner. It's sucking up lots of things. Like, for example, did you, did you notice anything just as we were reading that even? Come to your mind? That's okay. Oh, sorry, that's okay. Well, just for fun. Yeah, look at sentence two. Hemes ekamen exousian baptize. Humes de uk ekete exousian krinen hemas. 
Did anything kind of jump out to your mind? Did you notice anything? Oh, you notice some infinitives. Awesome. There you go. Good. And you even notice plural infinitives, right? Baptizane and crinane. Awesome. And that's not nothing. And that, and the, so that's what I would, I, I encourage folks to just read the whole thing because you'll, again, it'll, it'll just become more natural versus like truly going like word for word or just going verb hunting. If you're stuck, you could totally do that though. But I always feel like it's better just to like look at the whole thing, uh, read to a nice strong punctuation mark. It may be a semicolon and that's totally fine. You know, read to a strong punctuation mark and then kind of go, okay, now what's my verb? Or verbs. In this case, we notice two infinitives on our reading. I notice two, you know, verbs. I notice that both verbs are from echo. I have. It looks like we have one echo versus uk ekete, right? Something, somebody has, somebody does not have, right? And so you, there are certain things you just kind of pick up, even if, um, <laughs> one of my favorite film critics always says, you might not have noticed, but your brain did. Like, there's just, you're just taking in all kinds of things, even if you can't necessarily um, fix your mind on it and say, this is what I saw. Anyway, so yeah, otherwise, yeah, grab your verb, go from there. Um, another thing that I found really helpful is um, getting rid of information can be really helpful. So for example, let's just take that previous sentence, and let's say you didn't know exactly what was go going on with Tala'an. Um, one thing that you can, uh, and again, these are not super long, super complicated sentences, but, you know, if, if you get to that point where you're able to read Paul, you know, Paul may have, you know, six, seven line sentences, and you're just truly on the hunt for, like, the basic structure of it. Like, really, it's, it's something else. So anyway, so one other tactic is to just, like, get rid of stuff. And again, it's, it, like, I can just see that's, like, to the people. I know I'm not hunting for to the people yet. Like that prepositional phrase, that's going to come very much at the end. Not only because it's at the end of the sentence, but because like I need basic structure and to the people is not going to help me find that structure. So the longer and more complicated the sentences become, the more relative clauses, the longer and more complicated prepositional phrases. The you know, and it just gets more and more and more. And so like all of life, the art becomes the art of attending to what matters most. And so, again, relative clauses, prepositional phrases, those kinds of subordinated things. You're just trying to, like, just be quiet for a second. I'm trying to get the basic structure. Does that make sense? So that, that's another strategy. And that, um, again, if uh, I had a student today. We were reading the laws of Sparta, or actually a Roman historian writing about the Spartans' laws. And I had a student come in and said, Mr. McCord, I didn't understand anything that I read. I said, great, I'm going to start off with you today in class. She's like, why would you do that? And I was like, because you told me you didn't understand anything. And I know that's not true. She's like, you're so mean. So anyway, I said, all right, uh, what'd you get out of the reading? She's like, nothing. He, I don't understand anything he did. I was like, actually, it's interesting. You used a masculine pronoun for Lycurgus. Why'd you use a masculine pronoun? Because like, he's a guy. I said, I mean, you told me you didn't get anything. And you're, now you're telling me he's some guy. Like, oh, this doesn't really count. Yeah, it totally counts. All right, so what else? I don't know, he did something with the Senate. Oh, okay, so what kind of a guy would, like, reform the Senate? I don't know, like a, like a guy in government? Good! Look, now you know he's a guy in the government of Sparta. That's more than most people know about Lake Cargus. Good job. Anyway, so. Anyway, filtering out the extra stuff. Trying to get to the essence of it. Turns out, Lycurgus is the Moses of Sparta. He gives them the law because Apollo gave it to him. So, that's not what this is about at all. <laughs> As I say to my students, this has nothing to do with that. They're totally unrelated. Just kidding. It's all related. Hence, universe. Thank y'all. I'm honored that you came.